I'm someone uh, who uh, is known primarily for work in history and philosophy of science, uh, but nevertheless, I do have this kind of theological background, and theology, I have to say, was actually my best subject when I was in high school. Uh, and theology was the way in which uh, we got into philosophy and a lot of other subjects, actually, that weren't formally taught in the curriculum. Um, and so with this in mind, throughout my entire career, um, I, I guess I've never seen such a clear separation between science and religion, okay? And so what becomes interesting then is how that division gets constructed. And especially from the standpoint of what you might call the censorship, self-censorship aspects of this. Um, and so this is why I titled the talk the way I did, right? Which is about the absence of divine agency as a positive explanatory principle in science. Right, not only from the people who don't believe in God, but also from the people who do believe in God. <laughs> right, right, so that's the thing. And, and it's not a new thing, right? The point is, this is something that in a way is very much part of the modern scientific mindset, if you want to think about it, um, as a kind of overarching ideology about how you think about what frame of mind you need to be in to do science. And of course, that comes back to the, you might say, the charter of the Royal Society, uh, right, and so the Royal Society is founded in 1660 in London, uh, and uh, it is after a very bloody civil war in England which was fought over religious differences, right, and those religious differences weren't just, uh, as it were, what you might call purely faith issues, right, they were, they were ones where, in a sense, a certain kind of conception of God implied a certain kind of way in which the material world worked, right, so, so the point is, Right, and also this had downstream effects with regard to what one considers right and wrong about the world. Right, so there was a kind of coherent, so all these guys who were in this civil war, all these various Christians, right, uh, basically have a kind of coherent worldview that goes from God to empirical phenomena. Right, and the problem is they couldn't sort out their differences and so they're fighting. That's basically what was going on. Um, and so after the, after the war was over, you, you got people who, in a way, inspired by Francis Bacon, right? Francis Bacon, who lives in the generation before the Civil War happens, right? Francis Bacon sees this coming in a way, right? Because we're already in the middle of the Protestant Reformation, right? And England uh, had relatively recently pulled away from the church and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and so he already said we needed a way of sort of sorting this out so that people aren't killing each other. But at the same time, we have to be quite rigorous about this because the established authorities, you know, in the church, right, are really not up to the task that is required to understand the nature of the world, right? They're just repeating the past. It's all tradition and dogma and so forth. And so we have to have, a, a, a as it were, an agency of the government, we would say, right, uh, that is in charge of actually putting these things that have been just handed down mindlessly for generations after generations through the universities right, uh, put them through some strict test, through some independent agency of the state, okay? And so you start already getting there a kind of attitude that, l that exists until the early 19th century, which is this hostility of science to the university, right? And if you look at the scientific revolution, right, it's very much hostility uh, to the university is involved. Even if people were trained in the university, nevertheless, the kind of tradition and dogma and difficulties of expressing things are there. But, but Bacon thought about this in a very kind of um, exotic and utopian kind of way, right? He basically was someone who thought that this kind of scientific procedure, right, uh, whereby we adjudicate knowledge claims outside of the parochial religious context would actually serve in a way as a new secular religion, right? And so if you look, you know, especially in the 19th century, or, you know, Auguste Comte, right, the founder of positivism, he clearly picked that up from Bacon. And that was, in a sense, what Bacon wanted to do. He wanted some kind of, um, kind of transformation of the knowledge-power relation, right, where, in a sense, the state and the religion fuse, because within Christianity, it's always, it, it's always been a very kind of ambiguous and uh, often uncomfortable relationship, but he actually wanted, in some way, Right, that what people believe and, you know, and how the state is run should actually be very closely tied together. That actually was his intention. Okay, that was actually what he was going after. People, you know, you know uh, and, and, uh, but after the Civil War, right, so the Civil War happens, people in a way downsize Bacon's ambitions. 
right? Because what they're more concerned about after the war is they don't want another war, right? And so this then becomes the great exodus from explanation, right? Because where explanation involves, right, the fundamental principles but from which everything derives. And that's where God would be potentially involved, right? And so what you do is you basically cut off that, and then what you say is, look, the kind of things that we're going to discuss here in the Royal Society are going to be the things that we can measure, we can calculate, right? Uh, you know, that we can actually get people who otherwise come from different religious or metaphysical orientations could agree on. And that is the charter, right? The charter is about that. And if you can't abide by that, you're out. And so some of you who follow science and technology studies perhaps know this very famous book from uh, uh, 40 years ago now uh, called Leviathan and the Air Pump by uh, Simon Schaffer and Steve Shapin, right? And this book is basically about how Thomas Hobbes, who wasn't going to abide by this, and he was, by the way, the private secretary of Francis Bacon, right? So Hobbes is an old man by the time the Royal Society gets established, but he remembers, he remembers Bacon, right? And he wasn't going to allow this, right? And it says he violated this this kind of separation. And he was booted out of the Royal Society, right? So, so and, and this sort of set a precedent, right? A precedent that wasn't just a political precedent, but also a philosophical precedent, because throughout the history of the philosophy of science, there's always been this kind of open-ended question, you might say, about whether science explains things, right? And whether once you start to get into the realm of explanation, you're somehow leaving science. Right? And this is a view that has been very comfortable for lots of different people. Right? It's been very comfortable, obviously, for the religious people. Right? And, and in the modern period, right, those of you who do philosophy of science will know about Pierre Duhem, right, who was a Catholic, right, and very much stuck to this view and gave a very, kind of, very strong kind of medieval legitimation for this as being part of the way in which science, in fact, has naturally developed, where there's no break between the Middle Ages and the modern period. Right? This is his story. And that certainly justified separation of explanation and what, we, what, what gets called description, right? That, 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 which is what science is about, right? But then there are other people as well who are in a sense of not particularly religious people, but people worried about anything that might fill the vacuum of explanation, right? It might not just be religion, but it might be some secular ideology, like Nazism or communism or something like that. And here I would put the logical positivists. Right? The logical positivists have the same kind of view, right, that you want to make some very, you know, you want to say, look, we're not really talking about explanation. And even when positivists give an account of explanation, it is something like a glorified universal description. Right? Uh, I mean, they're very suspicious, let's put it that way, about ideas of unobservable causes, for example. That's the default position of positivism. Of course, some positivists make various accommodations, and a lot of the sort of post-positivist philosophy of science has been about that accommodation. But for the most part, right, there's a suspicion around the idea of explanation, okay? So that's, and if, you, if I wanted to say what's the mainstream philosophy of science, it's kind of like that, right? Because it, 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 and, and, and it kind of circumscribes what science can do. But not everybody's been on that trajectory. There are some people who have said that science is about explanation and that in some sense science has to engage with the kinds of questions that are, you know, have traditionally come from theology. Okay? And so in the modern period we would think about people like William Huell. So William Huell is this British guy in the mid-19th century. He's the person who coins the word scientist in English to name a profession. Because science is something all kinds of people have always done, but the idea that you need to be professionally trained to be a scientist, right, that's something he invented, and it was also part of a general kind of move to establish the scientist as a kind of social role in society. So the, you know, the, the British Association for the Advancement of Science, all these kinds of public-facing kind of organizations, right, are very much part of what you'll had in mind, and he said, well, look, science is going to explain. It's not going to explain by replacing religion, but in some sense answering religion's questions. That's kind of the way to, I would say to put it. And, and how, why do I put it this way? Well, because if you look at the kinds of uh, things he presupposes about good explanations, 
right, that they have to be unified, they have to draw together facts from many different kinds of places, right, uh, they have to be independently corroborated, which means that no two individuals have to already know what's going on, right, it has to have some kind of higher kind of cognitive reach, right, that's God, right, that's the mind of God, right, that's the, the kind of idea that Newton, and not just Newton, but it goes back into the Middle Ages with St. Bonaventure, for example, the mind's journey to God, Right, right, that you have this kind of idea that uh, to understand the world is to understand the mind of God, right? And that's where the unity comes from. Because you might ask yourself, isn't it good enough just to have explanations of individual things or particular domains of reality, like Aristotle did, for example, right? Aristotle explained everything according to its own kind of cause. And there are some people who still like that idea, including religious people. But that's kind of against the spirit right, of what we're talking about here. Because in a sense, what Huell was getting after, and you see this also, let's say, in Charles Sanders' purse, right? He also was like that. And you might say at a stretch, somebody like Karl Popper's kind of reaching in that direction, right? These are all people who in a way really resisted the kind of instrumentalist positivist line that I was talking about earlier, and sort of were going after something kind of transcendent, okay? They didn't talk about God, well, actually, Peirce talked about God, but the point is, they weren't, they weren't um, kind of getting into the theological discussions directly, but the way they were configuring what is relevant for an explanation for sci in science was theological in, in, in the sense of the broad metaphysical scope. Because there's no empirical reason why we need to think that there's some unified understanding of, of everything to be had unless you have a prior belief. And that prior belief may be right, uh, that we are created in the image and likeness of God who did all this as a kind of neat, rational package, right? I mean, in a sense, that's kind of the bottom line assumption of all this drive to explanation in the way that physicists, at least a lot of physicists, still pursue today, right? Without that assumption, there's no reason why you should think that things have to be explained in some kind of unified fashion, and that's somehow a, an ultimate goal of science, because again, think Aristotle. Aristotle had causes for everything. And they were separate, and they were causes appropriate to the domains, right, in which the phenomena existed. And the causes weren't that far away from the expression of the phenomena in nature, right? So there weren't these great, deep, unobservable causes that were remote from our ordinary observation. They were relatively close to them, right? A kind of earthbound way of looking at the world. That's Aristotle. Okay? And the scientific revolution, to a large extent, was about overturning that. Now, unfortunately, I think uh, the way this gets cast, right, is, you know, we say during the scientific revolution, uh, we get the rise of the mechanical worldview. That's not false, but could be misleading. Um, and we get rid of final causes from nature. Yeah, we get rid of final causes from nature, but what happens is final, all those final causes that Aristotle had gets wrapped up into this kind of unified what God has in mind. So everything becomes trying to figure out what God's thinking. That's the final cause. And everything else along the way in terms of how nature expresses itself are just means to that end. And in that sense, it's mechanistic, right? And so then you start asking questions about how do certain phenomena, why do they function the way they do? How do organisms function the way they do? Where you're not, you're not treating these things as ends in themselves, but rather as means for our understanding a larger plan. Okay? Now, the way this got really explicitly, this point, got really explicitly made during the scientific revolution was during this period, very controversial period, which some people perhaps would wish to forget, but... but I think really profound, and that is the issue of theodicy. Theodicy, uh, some of you may know, right? So this is an area, right, it's an area that in a way goes back to St. Augustine, of course, but, but, but in the early modern period, in light of the stuff that's going on otherwise in the scientific revolution, you start to get a shift in theological argument, right, where, where in a sense the theologians are beginning to get rid of Aristotle themselves. And so then they're kind of reintroduce, you know, they're reintroducing the issue of final cause, but they're doing that to figure out the mind of God, right? Uh, and, and so this then leads to all kinds of interesting and very provocative arguments, right? Because obviously, 
right, from an empirical standpoint, again, this is the scientific revolution, the empirical starting point, and it's always the starting point of the atheists as well, right, why is there evil in the world? Right, if there is a God, why is there evil in the world, right? So the, the, ask the question that way, right, it's a very empirical way of asking the question, and it very much suits the kind of 17th, 18th century mindset that theologians themselves had already got themselves into, right? Where they're saying, look, on the surface, things look bad. Not only at the moral level, but at the natural level. Catastrophes, natural catastrophes, all of a sudden get very momentous, okay? Um, and so you get some very interesting arguments about, you know, why things are so bad. Well, they're bad because they're means to a larger end. And this is the kind of position that gets ridiculed by Voltaire, right, in Candide with reference to Leibniz, right? Because Leibniz says we live in the best possible world because, right, that's the only world God could create. And the fact that it has all this bad stuff in it is really a way of trying to teach us a lesson on how to improve ourselves, right? So the point is all the bad stuff is didactic, right? It's necessary because we are fallen creatures. And that is part of the story, right? That humans don't have a direct contact to God's mind, right? We're fallen, and so we have to figure it out. And in a sense, all of this evil and bad stuff that happens are prompts, right? They're kind of ways, you know, for us to kind of rethink and recalibrate and so forth, okay? Now, Voltaire thought this was ridiculous, right? Um, and there's an interesting kind of scientific debate that's going on that went on a generation earlier that sort of parallels this, and Leibniz was involved in that too, and that had to do with Leibniz and Newton in terms of whether Newton actually explained how the world worked, okay? Um, and, and this is where the famous so-called uh, God of the gaps argument comes from, if those of you who are familiar with this kind of stuff. Because Newton has this amazing, unprecedented kind of mathematical articulation of how the world system works, except that not everything works. Right, some of, the, some of the equations don't work. You have to put in some fudge factors every now and then. It, it, it's not quite as elegant as he makes it out to be, okay? Uh, and Leibniz, his critique basically says, Newton, you haven't done the job, right? That in a sense, right, God being, you know, who can only create the best possible world, which will be in the most efficient economical set of laws, the fact that your laws don't work all the time means that your laws are not the final word. Get it, right? And Newton says no, right? Newton says, well, actually, you see, uh, a God is, is, is a kind of a, has free will. And God is creating this law-like universe on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So at every moment along the way, God could choose to do otherwise, and perhaps he does sometimes. And that would explain miracles, that would explain all kinds of aberrations that go on, right? Uh, and, and, and so there is this argument that's taking place Right, that, uh, that starts off as an argument about the, you know, the effectiveness of the scientific presentation that then turns into an argument about God's free will, okay? And, and, and you know, Leibniz said, well, look, God had to create the best possible world. We just haven't figured it out yet. And so we just carry on doing science, and you're not the last word, Newton. We just keep on going. Don't, don't, don't take too many congratulations from this. That's basically Leibniz's view. Now, if you take that kind of view, of course, and this is the view that a lot of deists and others in the 18th century took, right, uh, then you say, well, look, if that's the game you're playing, you don't need to talk about God anymore. You've already figured out what God is. God is, God is this guy, whoever he is, right, who creates this world under the most economical set of formulas that work under all possible situations. And once you've done that work, you've discovered God. There's no surplus God. Right? Which means, in, in, in theological terms, there's no transcendent God. Right? And that's what this argument turns out to be about when you move into the secular realm. Because it's in the context of these kinds of discussions right, about you know, how God operates. So with Leibniz and Newton, it's still an argument about divine agency. But very soon, as we move into the 18th century, it becomes, this term gets used initially to, to describe Spinoza who in a way is a, is a bit like Leibniz, uh, and naturalism. Naturalism, you're familiar with this term, very important term in philosophy of science. Atheists consider it the house metaphysics, right? Um, and, and the thing about naturalism, right, it, it, it was, this term was coined to talk about the lack of need for the supernatural, that there is, as it were, no transcendent level. There is no sense in which the divine is surplus 
right to the secular. Right, that once you've figured out the totality of the secular, you've explained the divine. There's no remainder, right? Uh, and naturalism was coined for that view. It was coined for that view. And this was a view that was traced from Averroes, right, the, uh, the, the Muslim thinker who in a sense had a view that was very proto-Leibnizian, right? And, and Leibniz, even though Leibniz thought of himself as a wonderful Christian, nevertheless, he was boxing God into a corner, basically, right? Um, and when you get into the early 19th century, when people have had some time to think about all this, right, you get guys, guys like Schopenhauer saying, well, to Leibniz, if this is the best possible world God could create it, and then he just disappears, this is not a God worth believing in, because this is miserable, and there's nothing after it. This is it. Right? So stop believing altogether. Right? And then you, you move into this more Epicurean, Buddhist kind of space, right? Where you don't even think about there being a kind of supernatural anymore. Okay? Now, this is in a way how the, you know, God disappears from the picture. Right, in a way, God gets naturalized, and when he gets naturalized, right, uh, then nobody wants to talk about the transcendent anymore. Now I think, now you say, well, why, why did that happen, and how did that happen? Well, I do think a lot of this has to do with an issue that, uh, in a way, actually motivated the rise of modern science, but over the period of modern science's development, kind of disappeared. And this is why I think there's a bit of a crisis of science these days, and why some people actually want to revive a lot of this theological stuff. And I have nothing, as you might gather from what I'm saying, I have nothing against reviving the theological stuff if it can be discussed openly, right? Um, but the point is, I think what happened was, in the early modern period, and if you want to look at uh, Peter Harrison, um, right, uh, he, 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 he's made his career kind of on this thesis, and I think it's a very profound thesis. Namely, uh, the rediscovery, a kind of um, neo-Augustinian rediscovery of the role of original sin uh, in the human condition that you start to get in the early modern period, right? Which is part of, you might say, the, the background of Protestantism, right? Where, because the, the, the tendency in the Catholic Church, uh, you know, from the early period into the early modern period was basically to downplay original sin uh, and, and, and that was probably for political reasons, given the, uh, the role that the Catholic Church played in you know, placating people and keeping people in power and making sure everything was peaceful and so forth. Um, and, and so that kind of doctrine sort of diminished, okay? Um, because the problem, the, the, the thing that, that became very clear once you, you start to reintroduce the notion of original sin is, especially if you're a believer, is that you take very seriously the things that are ordinarily presented to you before your eyes and from the authorities just need not be true. And there's probably a good chance they're false, right? Because the redemption of humanity hasn't happened yet. We're just as fallen now as we were in the beginning after Adam's fall. That hasn't gone away. So that, that pro propensity for error, right, is very much there. And this is, in fact, very much in the mind of somebody like Francis Bacon. When Francis Bacon wants to establish these institutions that very strongly challenge established authority and so forth, right? Because he says, we just can't take this stuff on people's word. People are corrupt. People are fallen. And we need a new way. Okay? Um, and that was a really powerful, that was, you know, if you want to talk about uh, why the scientific revolution was as comprehensive as it was, in other words, the fact that it was challenging so many beliefs in so many different fields. Why was there so much doubt? And you know, skepticism came back into fashion, as you know, in the early, uh, early modern period, right? Why was there so much doubt about everything all at once? Okay, it was because this idea of the fallen nature of humanity got taken very seriously. Okay, and then the question was, do we have ways of overcoming it? And Descartes, you know, I mean, that's a you know, case in point of someone who took, you know, who got on top of the issue, you might say, right? Uh, and, and came up with a kind of solution. Right, and so the point, so this became a really kind of serious issue. The problem was that once science became institutionalized, and in a sense science had effectively, and this happened quite gradually actually, right, it didn't happen automatically in the 17th century, but let's say by the time you get to the late 19th century, um, right, you have science effectively replacing uh, theology, right, as the primary authorizer of knowledge claims, right? 
Um, and, then, and that is on the back of a kind of metaphysics, right, which basically says the transcendent God is surplus to requirements. And so that even if you're a believer, you can kind of believe in a kind of naturalistic God, right, a God, a kind of pantheistic God, a God who in a way exhaustively unfolds itself in nature. Put it that way, right? A God who exhaustively unfolds itself on na in nature. And I, I use this way of putting it uh, because nowadays, of course, uh, we've got theistic evolutionists, for example, and they are like that, right? That there is a sense in which if you want to understand God, you have to understand the fullness of nature and how it unfolds, and evolution is going to be very central for that kind of line. On the other hand, we have these intelligent design people who I've been associating with, and they're much more like the original Protestants of the scientific revolution. They believe in a transcendent God. They believe that there is, in fact, this big difference between what God knows and what we know. And so that puts them kind of, um, you, you might say, their default position is to actually be very suspicious of authority, right? Especially if you look at the way in which the institutions of science are, in fact, established. And that's the thing we can say now, right? That we live in a period with an unprecedented amount of sociology of science. We know what the size and shape of science is. We know about how you know, money and talent get channeled to work in certain kinds of fields, but not others. We know that. That, is, that empirical phenomena about the nature of science on the ground has never been clearer. Right? Uh, and at the same time, of course, we also know that people who do try to talk about God in scientific journals just don't have a look in. Right? And, and that is real problematic, not, not, not just for the uh, established authorities, but it's also problematic for the people who do want to introduce ideas of divine agency. Because one of, the prob one of the things that was so interesting about reading those discourses on theodicy in the uh, 17th and 18th century is you know, the degree to which people like Leibniz and Newton would get very articulate about how, what God might have done and how why you do it and how that connects up with the physics. There were some very interesting kinds of moves right, that were made where the theology right, and, and the mathematics and the physics were all co-articulated. Okay? That kind of discussion is really not allowed to flourish. Right? If you're going to believe in God, it's got to be something separate. It's like something you do on, your, you know, on the weekends or something. Right? Uh, you may recall the late Stephen Jay Gould talk about these dual magisteria, right? science and religion, never the twain shall meet. Right? That's basically what he's talking about. Right? They're separate but equal. But saying separate but equal is like the old separate but equal in the United States, right? which, which applied to the races. Uh, and, and I think we are suffering from this kind of problem now, right? that there is no space to actually articulate right, the sense in which there might be some kind of divine presence that would motivate us for think, to think, for example, that there is a kind of unified picture of the, of the world that we ought to be aiming at. Because my point, I guess my point would be, and this is, I'll, I'll close on this point, is that if you don't believe that there is a kind of unified intelligence that in some sense we're trying to fathom, and that is, you know, understood in terms of whatever laws or whatever, uh, you know, fundamental principles we're striving to get at, right, unless you believe it, you know, unless you believe that, it's not clear why we're pursuing this. Because we can explain stuff at a much lower level, closer to the phenomena, do what Aristotle was doing, and get along perfectly well for thousands of years. And that's, in fact, how most cultures have, in fact, operated. Right? They haven't been striving to get into some mind of God. Right? They have just been trying to understand stuff at the level that it matters to them on the ground. And that does require coming up with some things they've never thought about before, some causes they've never seen before. But it has required this really expansion, you know, expansive way of thinking, which is the characteristic of modern science. Okay? So that's the issue. I think if we don't bring the theological stuff back in, then this kind of expansionist vision of science no longer holds. Just doesn't, I mean, at least it's not motivated. It's not very well motivated anymore. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, the questions. Uh, so, one strand of this, uh, if you wish, sort of a uh, Aristotelian and combination of Aristotelian and naturalistic understanding of science, which has been kind of dominant in a way for yeah, the last, like, 
yeah, in re recent decades and you know, for, for a while now. Uh, there is one thing that came out of it. So if you do that very thoroughly and consequentially, then uh, the danger is that's what sort of happened to physics. It, that will throw you off and basically inevitably lead you to very kind of a quasi-theological questions. So for example, not only the, the understanding that uh, microphysical world is way more complex, counterintuitive, that we don't even have good ontology to understand that, but that we have, if we are very consequential at the macro level, we have at one point to give up the idea that space and time are something that's kind of like the top of the world and that we don't, there is, so very clear understanding with that perhaps we don't understand the, nor can we understand as human uh, 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 so reasoners the basic parameters of the physical world. And then the question is, uh, maybe there are other minds very unlike us that can actually do that, and we get only the glimpses. Yeah. And then suddenly, you know, the story about the, simu the world as a simulation and all that. So I think that's one of the lines that may be actually m more and more dominant, it yeah, seems yeah. to I, me. I, actually, so I'm very sympathetic with this kind of critique of, of, of what he's correct, right? What, what Slub was saying is correct. That, that if you look at a lot of uh, philosophy of science, especially of, of our generation, uh, there's a return to Aristotle, right, under the guise of naturalism, uh, and it runs into these problems, right? Because if you follow that kind of route, you're never going to come with the, you know, up with the radic, you know, uh, radically counterintuitive metaphysical insights. You certainly wouldn't have been, you would have gotten to them uh, if you had this kind of metaphysics that, that people have nowadays, right? That in fact, it, it, so if you want to talk about the, you know, the, the crazy quantum effects, you want to talk about you know, the large stuff with regard to relativity, uh, all of it in a way requires that you abstract from the physical human body. You can't use that as kind of a, uh, a kind of intuitive marker for how to understand reality. In some sense, you have to be able to abstract. And see, when I say abstract, I want you with a theological frame of mind to think transcend, right? That there's a sense that the, phys you know, we find ourselves in a certain kind of physical body which causes us to relate to the world in a certain way that we get used to by virtue of being physical creatures, but that is not the sum total of what the universe is, right? That is only the universe in which we inhabit as physical beings. But part of the, the brilliance, right, of, of, of science, and, and this starts with the revolutions in mathematics, right, is the capacity for people to think in a way that abstracts themselves from the body, right, thinking multidimensionally, right, you know, and, and people do that with more or less degrees of success, right, I'm not saying all of this stuff is successful, but I, you, you see, the motivation to do that, which has been so important in the development of modern science, because if you want to say what, what has been most characteristic of the development of modern science that actually justifies moving away from Aristotle is the counterintuitiveness of it. Right, that most of the things, most of the explanations that we have for, for phenomena in science takes us miles away from ordinary understandings of things. It brings in new concepts, new ways of looking at things, right, that have to be mediated through formalisms and, you know, and you know, computer technology and all the rest of it, right, that kind of abstractive process, right, uh, in a way shows the shortcomings of staying within this Aristotelian framework. And so that's, and, and it seems to me that a lot of these guys who are theologically motivated these days. And I'm, I always notice this about the intelligent design people, right? Because everybody always says the intelligent design people aren't specialists in evolutionary biology. That's true. But what are they specialists in? Mathematics, computer science, right? These more abstract fields, right? And in a sense, they're approaching the problem that way. You see? And, and so I do think there, there is something to this, right? right? But the point is, I, I want to put a proviso in this, right? Um, what you can't just do is to go back to the Bible or something in some sort of, you know, say, well, you know, all this empirical science is false. We're going back to the Bible. No, in some way, you have to do what Newton did, right? Because as you know, Newton was someone whose largest, you know, collection of books was on theological matters, and he wrote the most about them, right? Um, but nevertheless, he used that as an in inspiration to, m to do his mathematics, which had payoff even for people who did not share his religious beliefs. And in fact, that's the, 
great genius of him is that, right? Because that's stuff we only found out about later, right? Um, and so that's what's needed in the theological revival. You need that kind of articulation that somebody like Newton exemplified. Um, hi, thank you. Really, really interesting talk. Um, so just to ensure that I was, I was following along quite right, um, two magisterium, we got, we got science here, theology there, never the two shall. Shami, and you, you expressed some dissatisfaction with this. It's a shame. Um, if you're a scientist, you want to write about God in a science journal, perhaps forget about it, ain't going to happen. Great shame, because when we look at Newton, uh, Leibniz, there's a good maneuvers happening there, and there's something worth looking at. Yes, but, but I have to say, even in the 17th century, it was in the private correspondence. Right, right, of course, of course. <laughs> it's not, it, wasn't, yeah, it, wasn't in, it wasn't in general. There were problems then, too. Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> but I, I, I wanted to, um, and I imagine one of the reasons why some scientists might be reluctant to do that now would be this idea of naturalism, God's transcendent to nature, supernaturals, outside of scope, let's not bother. I, I was wondering to see, to see what your opinions would be about what science as science can do in the study of religious things. So my interest being in miracles here. Uh -huh. what, what could the scientist do when it comes to a miracle? Like, I know, it, sometimes we have uh, atheists online saying, show me a miracle in lab conditions. And this strikes me as a little bit absurd. But, but is it, though? Could we imagine a scientist trying to verify that something was miraculous? Well, look, I mean, at a theoretical level, it's possible. I mean, you know, you might want to chime in on this, actually. Um, the, uh, you know, depending on how you, you know, depending on what interpretations of probability theory you use and so forth, right, that one, in a sense, could expect miracles every now and then, right? I mean, there are, there are ways of understanding the way in which nature operates under some kind of probabilistic framework where you know they're calling it miracles, right? Because they don't actually have the probability theory that actually explains why the thing happened, right? But the thing could happen just as, you know, unpredictably, right? And be just as momentous. And look, a lot of this stuff, I don't know, a lot of the stuff that's associated nowadays with chaos theory and stuff like that has some of this quality to it, right? Um, and, and so, you know, what, what's lacking in, in these explanations of miracles is perhaps just the adequate mathematics you know, within which it could be understood. But that doesn't necessarily, you know, it, it is something that could still be a miracle, right? It, you know, I mean, I, I just think one would obviously have to move away from the, from the suggestion that miracle by definition is unexplainable, right? Which I think is what the atheists, you know, who attack miracles are trading on, right? Uh, and the problem is a lot of religious people fall back on that, right? A lot of religious people say, okay, if it's a miracle, I can't explain it, you know, and they use God you know, in a way as a pseudo explanation, because they're not going to tell you how God did it, right? If, if they could tell you how God did it, that would be an explanation. But if they just invoke God as a way of stopping the discussion, right, th then, you know, so this is where the atheist, rhetorically speaking, you know, makes sense, right? Right, in the sense that you, you actually have to come up with an explanation. And it could be one coming from God, but it has, it has to do some explanatory work. And I always think, Mathematics is a good way to go on things like this. One big debate in science that really is kind of tangential to this worry is the question of fine-tuning of the universe. Why are the, uh, so the, all the basic initial parameters of the universe are really unlikely that exist now. Uh, but they are necessary in order for us to be here, right? So there's whole anthropic reasoning in uh, cosmology, which sort of splits people because it turned out to be very useful as a heuristic tool to come up with discoveries, key discoveries in, in uh, the astrophysics of stars and so on. But then, you know, there's this kind of a uh, thing that people are, some people are uneasy, well, you know, fine tuning, we are very close to the kind of theological way of uh, reasoning, and you can't really avoid it. So that's one big sort of a already existing uh, discussion along the lines of the, so, you know, it's sort by, of a by miracle. The way, in, in terms yeah. of this, if you really want to get into the, you know, this, this guy Frank Tipler. Oh, yeah, he goes like really far. Like, yeah. I, are you familiar with yeah. Frank Tipler? Yeah, he's like, Check a, out yeah, no. yeah. So his book is uh, Physics and Immortality, right? The Physics so, of Immortality. He, physics of Immortality. So he's a cosmologist. I mean, big career cosmologist, yes. made like big contributions. But he has his sort of anthropic sort of a, 
account and he goes so far to actually basically give a secular version of cosmological story that goes along with the sort of a uh, Christian kind of a Yeah, I, I actually creation. do recommend It's really you know, incredible, a book, I recommend actually. this book. I mean, to, to, because what he, is, what he does, the way the book is written, it's kind of like a book Newton would have written if he were around now. So he actually talks about the Bible, for example, right? But then he brings in all this mathematics and he brings in proper physics. And, and he, show, you know, he shows alignments with all these things. And he does it for hundreds and hundreds of pages, right? It's, it's, it's a very well-articulated thing. I mean, the problem, of course, is when you articulate things that well, people think you're crazy, right? right? I mean, right? Because it's like an obsessive compulsive new disorder. Uh, uh, but, 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 but no, but, but you, it's, it's worth looking at. I'm, a friend, I'm actually a friend of his. Uh, but, but uh, you know, yeah, it's, that would be something to look at. I was just wondering where would, in, in, in the story that you were telling, uh, where would the following fit? So, so there's naturalism, right? And, and we kind of, um, the, the transcendent is kind of out of bounds. It, it's not uh, to feature in our um, explanations, scientific explanations. Um, it seems to me that around the same time, especially in the early modern period, um, it, it's not that it seems to me, it's sort of a well-known account of how things uh, were kind of unfolding, that uh, there's this switch in the understanding of uh, man's place in, uh -huh. in nature, in the world, yeah. right? There's the Copernican Revolution, yeah. then there's Hume, yeah, then yeah, there's right. Darwin, right? So That's one way to play the story, yes. Right, right. So, so instead of going for these very ambitious, rationalistic, metaphysical systems of, you know, like Leibniz and Spinoza and even Descartes, where it seems like we can explain everything, perhaps even a priori, right? I mean, uh, we can sort of hook into the, the very fabric of the universe. The book of nature is open to us in principle. Perhaps we can't really figure everything out in, in you know, like particular details, but it's there for the having, right? We're, we're sort of on God's level in terms of uh, capacity of, you know, like having mathematical knowledge of sorts, you know, like we, we, we can't know all the truths, but what we can know, we can kind of know the way God does, right? When it comes to mathematics or, or something of the sort. But then, yeah, this you know, other thing this, this other thing happens, mm -hmm. right? So, so we become much more pessimistic about who yes. we are, where our place in nature yes. is. Perhaps we can just, you know, we're kind of, uh, we're more like animals, right? <laughs> and and yes. uh, so perhaps we can't figure well, things out. I have a lot out, to say you know. about this, yes. Right, okay, so yeah, uh, take this as a prompt. I'm, okay, I'm okay. Well, the first thing to say, uh, when we talk about the Copernican Revolution, right? Uh, remember, the Copernican Revolution is about displacing the, cent the Earth as the center of the universe, right? And saying Earth is just one of many things rolling around. Now, um, obviously that move, which was so important for the whole scientific revolution, wasn't a move of pessimism at all, right? In a sense, it, was re it saw itself as kind of, a, you know, in this sense, Duem was right, right? A kind of culmination, right, of human beings rediscovering their divine entitlement, right? Uh, because look, if you're gonna talk about a, a world where the earth is just one part, maybe a very remote part of a larger picture, what point of view do you need to have in order to make that a reasonable view, right? What would motivate you to even think this way? Because if you look at most of the, you know, most of the world's cosmologies, right, they are earthbound, because that's the world in which people normally live and all that jazz, right? But the point is to actually think, and this goes to the issue you were raising earlier about uh, these you know, extraterrestrials, other life forms. In this same period, right, of Copernicus and, right, and in the Renaissance and the early modern period, right, you get a lot of active interest going on on the possibility of there being extraterrestrials, precisely because one of the things that human beings had succeeded to do was to abstract themselves from their physical existence on Earth and to imagine that they may be communicating with beings from different places, with different bodies, but nevertheless there would be some kind of common way, you know, of a meeting of minds, you might say. Okay? That the scientific, that's what the scientific revolution enabled. Okay? Now, now Darwin. Let's, let's move fast forward to Darwin, because I, I do think that that's kind of that's kind of the, uh, so when you look at Kant, for example, okay, so I think of Kant, let's say, as a kind of halfway point 
between where the scientific revolution started, which was this very expansionist and you know, very ambitious kind of way of seeing the world from God's standpoint, right, uh, into Darwin, where, as you said, we are reduced to animals. Kant's in the middle of this, okay? Because part of what Kant's doing, especially the critique of pure reason, right, is to uh, criticize the overambitious claims that a lot of these theologically inspired guys in the 18th century were making about what we can know about God's plan and justify all kinds of things, right? So, so Kant is usually seen as the, the great killer of theodicy, right? If you, if you want to talk about a philosopher who said, look, theodicy is rubbish, you know, um, he's the one, right? Because in a sense, there are limits, you know, so we could speculate, but we can't pass this off as knowledge. And, and, and what this did lead to uh, in, the, in the 19th century was very interesting kinds of discussions about the limits of, in, of, of intuition. The limits of intuition, okay? And about the degree to which we can intuitively see things without working it out completely. And this is a discussion that happens in many different kinds of fields, but it's largely motivated by the kind of intu you know, intellectual intuition that people like Leibniz were claiming that we had, which enabled us to see into the mind of God, okay? And so Kant is, in a way, he's the halfway point. But Kant doesn't offer any kind of real theory about, you know, we're just earthbound creatures and stuff like that. In fact, he kind of tends to see all this theological stuff as basically defining the limits of our thinking without going any further. But Darwin, of course, does. Now, one of the interesting things that happens when we get to Darwin, right, is uh, Darwin has a really enormous cultural impact relatively soon after Origin of Species comes out. And it cannot be underestimated. Obviously, we're feeling the effects today, right? But the, one of the things that happened was you do get a kind of re-understanding re of the history of philosophy, for example. And I say this because, you know, um, Darwin's great public defender was Thomas Henry Huxley. You may have heard of him, Tom, Darwin's bulldog. He's the guy who began the revival of David Hume. Right? He published a short book, because David Hume had been largely ignored, actually, uh, short, you know, after he died. At least he, he wasn't ignored, but he was thought to be a historian, right? Because Hume wrote all these historical works about England, right? right? But he wasn't seen as a philosopher. And, and da Thomas Henry Huxley actually wrote a book casting Hume as a naturalistic philosopher, you know, as a precursor of Darwin. And it came out in a popular series of books in the 1870s, okay? And so then you start to get the story built. Right, and people like Bertrand Russell and others right, kind of build on this, and then you end up getting this kind of story that you were articulating. But this was something that, in a way, began right, in the late 19th century as a revival of Hume, because Hume was the empiricist. Because if you think about all those empiricists, Locke and Berkeley, they're not necessarily safe travelers with Darwin. Right? They're a little too theological, both of them. Okay? But Hume is OK, because he's not theological. And so if, you, you know, so if you want to talk about, I need philosophers who can back my empirical methods, and you look at who the empiricists are, Hume's really the only one that you could pick up on. And that, in fact, had an enormous amount of influence, right? The final thing I would say about Huxley, which was relevant to the point, is that before Huxley died, he gave this very famous speech called Evolution and Ethics, which officially was a response to Herbert Spencer. But what he said, this is the 1890s, he was saying that the big problem facing 20th century uh, was going to be motivating science once people take seriously Darwin's view of humans. Because the whole divine entitlement thing has gone out the window, and that was, in fact, driving everything from the early modern period onward, and it made so much progress, and Huxley was a big believer in progress and imperialism and all that kind of stuff, right? But now with Darwin, you know, everything gets scaled down, right? Uh, how, why are people going to continue doing science at the scale and the kind of you know, ambition that the people in the previous two centuries had been doing? So, you know, and I think we're faced with that question, right? That is the question that we face. I'm very much afraid that this one is not to be so short. Well, thank you first for your very elaborate and knowledgeable uh, presentation and, and the speech. I enjoyed it immensely, especially since you have deconstructed this opposition between, you know, the split uh, science and the faith and um, your final um, suggestion that we should relate to these uh, theological questions is quite appealing to me, I mean, uh, perfect. And uh, but just to add a little bit of uh, problematic flavor to it, if you allowed me to, 
I might try to ask you, um, can we really cherry picking only those theological issues that we find relevant, or we need to address the whole system of faith and the whole dogma and the whole everything? And as soon as we start doing that, aren't we um, bound to end up with uh, some problems that sounds more or less ridiculous in any kind of scientific s circumstances surrounding? Let me um, add one more thing. Um, mostly your argument refers to the real science, natural science and um, exact science. But for us who are not really that much scientific, like you know, I have spent all my life doing something that is called science, but it's not really science in those terms. Studying literature that is more theological on the theological side than on the scientific side. So we do relate to those questions all the time. Yet, um, what happens if uh, we say that we should then ask ourselves what about uh, all religious procedures and practices? Can we only address questions that are relevant for us and not relate to those procedures and practices that we still find all around the world? And my second question that might be a little bit shorter is uh, what about cultural history? Because, I mean, uh, you're so... Um, well educated and uh, established in one this field. But if we broaden the whole scope of religious and we try to ask theological questions from some religions that are not very related to the development of the science, let's start with the ancient Greeks and end up with uh, any sort of polytheism or uh, uh, what ends up. Are we then getting closer to superstition that you slightly omitted from your talk and superstitions? And let me now end up with a very long question. A uh, Hegelian one. Like, when we see that the science and the faith might end up in, in aufhebung of superstition that we believe that either one of them will help us get through. And then if you turn that upside down, then you will uh, see that uh, superstition uh, might construct a completely different path because it relies on our faith that we will uh, somehow solve our problems. Well, there's a lot going on there, okay? I'm not going to pretend to address all of it, uh, but, but um, I guess the first thing I would say, and in, in a way this relates to this discussion we were having about Frank Tipler earlier, um, one of the things that's interesting about him, because I do understand that there are certain kinds of uh, religious issues that in a way people might be very reluctant to kind of touch scientifically or, or, or religious people, you know, or religious people try to import these ideas. You know, so if you think about eschatology, right, uh, you know, or the issue of immortality of souls, right, that there might be, they might be reluctance on both sides to actually want to make that part of the mix, right? Um, I, 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 my, my view is that, that there's actually nothing wrong with that. To be honest with you, I think issues about immortality and eschatology are, are just because they arise from a theological context and they tend to be cast in a specific, you know, depending on what religion you're talking about, tend to be cast in a specific way, depending on the scriptures that you're using. Nevertheless, I do think that is something that can be discussed within a scientific framework by, and that scientific people ought to have an interest in it. In other words, it should not be something that's just dismissed out of hand as superstition. Right, that in other words, there is something being referred to here, right? I mean, um, I give you an example. Uh, you know, that that was in, during the Enlightenment. I don't know if some of you may know Joseph Priestley. Joseph Priestley was a great chemist who discovered oxygen, but he was also a Unitarian minister and a very so he was a man who held both the theology and science together, right? Um, and he and he would you know he would give these sermons where he's lacing the theology and the science, and so he has lectures on the resurrection of Jesus which is a, t a tricky issue, right, You're from, from the standpoint of this. Um, and he was literalist on that. And he said, we have to figure out how it happened. And so he starts talking about stuff that nowadays the cryonicists and transhumanism are talking about, right? You know, these cryonics people, right, who, who basically say just after you die, we put you in the deep freeze and then we resuscitate you. Okay, he's giving a prototype for this, right? Uh, and, and in the 19th century, when the Mormon church got established, the Mormons are kind of into this too. They were picking up on Priestley, right? Uh, and, and, and then, of course, you have the transhumanists who are very much into resurrection, right? You know, they have their own church of Latter-day Saints rising from the dead and all that jazz, right? I mean, I mean so, so there is this tradition 
right? There, there is that kind of stuff. And, and I would encourage that. Let's put it that way. I would encourage this kind of line of thinking. And of course, obviously, you know, see, one of the problems with something like, you know, cryonics and the resurrection and so forth is if the, that if you don't have a lot of different sorts of people looking at it, it can very easily get mystified, right? Which means that people hold views based on insufficient evidence, either views for or views against. And everything gets shrouded in mystery, and nothing can ever get resolved. And you see, that is one of the things that I really think would... So it's not about the topics, right? I think everything's fair game, right? But you have to open it up, you know? Uh, and, and I'm happy to, let's say, have a theologian in there talking to a cryonicist and say, look, that ain't resurrection, right? Say, why isn't this resurrection? Then he, you know, he says, resurrection is something else or something different. And then you know, the burden is on the theologian to say, what, what's the difference? Tell us what the difference is, and then we'll see what we can do. That is really what I'm talking about. In other words, I really do see theology as a kind of, a, you might say, alternative scientific program, and science as a kind of alternative theology, right? That, that is kind of where I'm coming from on this. Um, so I'll just, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.